Hello, everybody on YouTube. My name is Ashley E. Brock. And I originally started this channel because I was going to do audiobooks. I was going to record them and then share them on YouTube. But YouTube will not let you upload audio files, which is stupid. So now I have to record myself reading them. Which I also think is stupid because I didn't want to be seen reading the books because I don't like to look at myself. I figure other people don't like to look at me either. So what I'm going to do is it's going to be me in the beginning so everybody knows who I am. But then it's going to be a blank screen as I record the rest of it. And uh, anyways... I am Ashley E. Brock. I have a anchor channel, which you can listen to my audiobooks on Spotify. If you look up Ashley E. Brock, and it's a picture of a book, you might see the first episode of mine, which is called Grayson, on there, and it's a picture of my face, so you can figure out if you got the right podcast or not. If you like the audiobooks on here, then you can go there and listen to them for free on Spotify, and even download them later on. So you don't have to convert YouTube videos into audiobooks. Okay. So like I said, this is, my name is Ashley Brock. And I'm going to read Norma Roberts' book, Sea Swept. It's a four-book series. Her Chesapeake Bay series. And I believe these books could be turned into a TV show. Well, um, not TV show because there's only four books. But it could be turned into movies, maybe. So I hope you guys enjoy. Mm. Okay, sorry. It'll be a picture of my ceiling, but it's the same basic thing. So here is Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept. Uh, prologue and I own the, I bought a copy of this book so I own the book but not the rights to the book the, book, the rights to this book goes to Nora Roberts because she wrote it but it's one of my favorite books and I'm going to start with this book series because there's only four books in this book series alright so here it is Nora Roberts book Sea Swept Prologue Cameron Quinn wasn't quite drunk he could get there if he put his mind to it but at the moment, he preferred the nice, comfortable buzz of the nearly there. He liked to think it was just the two steps short of sloppy state that was holding his luck steady. He believed absently in the ebb and flow of luck, and right now, his, his was flown fast and hot. Just the day before, he raced his hydrofoil to victory in the world championship, edging out the competition by the point of the bow and breaking the standing record for time and speed. He had the glory and the hefty purse, and he'd taken both over to Monte Carlo to see how they held up. They held up just dandy. A few hands of back rat, a couple rolls of the dice, the turn of a card, and his wallet weighed heavier. Between the paparazzi and a reporter from Sports Illustrated, the glory showed no signs of dimming either. Fortune continued to smile. No, make that leer. Cameron thought, by turning him toward the little jewel in the mid, at the same time that popular magazine was wrapping its swimsuit ed edition shoot. And the leggiest of those long-stemmed gifts from God had turned her high summer blue eyes on him, tipped her full, pouty lips up in an invitational smile a blind man could have spotted, and opted to stay on a few days longer. And she made it clear that with very little effort, he could get a whole lot luckier. Champagne, generous casinos, mindless, no-string sex. Yes, indeed, Cameron mused, mused. Luck was definitely being his kind of lady. When they stepped out of the casino into the balmy March night, one of the ubiquitous paparazzi leaped out, snapping frequently. The woman pouted. It was, after all, her trademark look but gave her endless mane of ribbon-straight silver blonde hair an artful toss and shifted her killer body expertly. Her red is the color of sin dress, barely thicker than a coat of paint, made an abrupt halt just south of the gates of paradise. Cameron just grinned. They're such pests, she said with a hint of a lisp or a French accent. Cameron was never sure which. She sighed. 
testing the strength of that thin silk, and let Cameron guide her down the moon dampled street. Every place I look is a camera. I'm so weary of being viewed as an object for the pleasure of men. Oh yeah, right, he mused. Because he figured the pair of them were as shallow as a dry creek after a drought, he laughed and turned her into his arm. Why don't we give him something to splash on page one, sugar? He brought his mouth down to hers. The taste of her tickled his hormones, engaged his imaginations. It made him grateful their hotel was only two blocks away. She skimmed her fingers up into his hair. She liked the man with plenty of hair, and his was full and thick and as dark as the night around him. His body was hard, all tough muscle and lean, disciplined lines. She was very choosy about the body of a potential lover, and his more than met her strict requirements. His hands were just a bit rougher than she liked, not the pressure or movement of them. That was lovely, but the texture. They were a working man's hands, but she was willing to overlook their lack of class because of their skill. His face was intriguing, not pretty. She would never be coupled, much less allow herself to be photographed with a man prettier than she. There was a toughness about his face, a hardness that had to do with more than tan skin tight over bones. It was in the eyes, she thought as she laughed lightly and wiggled free. They were gray, more the color of flint than smoke, and they held secrets. She enjoyed a man with secrets, as none of them were able to keep them from her for long. You're a bad boy, Cameron, the accent was on the last syllable. She tapped a finger against his mouth, a mouth that held no softness whatsoever. So I've been always been told. He had to think for a moment as her name skimmed along the edges of his memory. Martin. Maybe tonight I'll let you be bad. I'm coming on. I'm counting on it, sugar. He turned toward the hotel, slanted a glance over. At six feet, she was nearly out of eye with him. My sweet or yours? Yours. She all but purred it. Perhaps if you order up another bottle of champagne, I'll let you try to seduce me. Cameron cocked an eyebrow, asked for his key at the desk. I'll need a bottle of Cristal, two glasses, and one red rose. He told the clerk while keeping his eyes on Martin. Right away. Yes, Miss Orquin, I'll take care of it. Rose? She fluttered at him as they walked to the elevator. How romantic. Oh, did you want one too? He, her puzzled smile warned him humor wasn't going to be her strong point. So they forgot the laughs and conversation, he decided, and shoot straight for the bottom line. The minute the elevator doors closed them in, he pulled her against him and met that sulky mouth with his own. He was hungry. He'd been too busy, too focused on his boat, too angled in on the race to take any time for recreation. He wanted soft skin, fragrant skin, curves, generous curves, a woman, any woman, as long as she was willing, experienced, and knew the boundary lines. That made Martine perfect. She let out a moan that wasn't altogether fiend for his benefit, then arched her throat for his nipping teeth. You go fast. He slid his hand down the silk, then up again. That's how I make my living, going fast, every time, every way. So holding her, he circled over, circled out of the elevator, down the corridor to his rooms. Her heart was ramping hard against his, her breath catching. In her hands, well, he figured she knew just what she was doing with him. So much for seduction. He unlocked the door, shoved it open, then closed it by bracing Martine against it. He pushed the two stringed wood straps off her shoulders, and with his eyes on hers, helped himself to those magnificent breasts. He decided her plastic surgeon deserved a medal. You want slow? Yes, the texture of his hands was rough, but God, exciting. She brought one mile long leg up, wrapped it around his waist. He had to give her full marks for a sense of balance. I want now. Good, me too. He reached up under her excuse for a skirt and ripped away the whisper of lace beneath. Her eyes went wide, her breath thickened. Animal, beast, and she fastened her teeth in his throat. Even as he reached for his fly, the knock sounded discreetly on the door behind her head. Every ounce of blood had drained out of his head to below his belt. Christ, servers can't be that good here. Leave it outside. He demanded and prepared to take the magnificent Martine against the door. Monsieur Quinn, I beg your pardon. A fact just came for you. It was marked urgent. Tell him to go away. Martine wrapped a hand around him like a clamp. Tell him to go to hell and fuck me. Hold on. I mean, he continued, unwrapped her fingers behind 
before his eyes could cross. Wait just a minute. He shifted her behind the door, took a second to be sure he was zipped, then opened it. I'm sorry to dis- No problem. Thanks. Cameron dug in his pocket for a bill, didn't bother to check the denomination, and traded it for the envelope. Before the clerk could babble over the amount of the tip, Cameron shut the door in his face. Martin gave that famous head toss again. You're more interested in a silly fax than me? Than this? With an expert hand, she tugged the dress down, wiggling free of it like a snake shedding skin. Cameron decided whatever she paid for that body, it had been worth every penny. No, believe me, baby, I'm not. This will just take one second. He ripped the envelope open before he could give in to the urge to ball it up, toss it over his shoulder, and dive headlong into all that female glory. Then he read the message in his world, his life, his heart stopped. Oh, Jesus, goddamn. All the wine, cheerfully consumed throughout the evening, swarmed giddily in his head, churred in his stomach, turned his knees to water. He had to lean back against the door to steady himself before reading it again. Cam, damn it, why haven't you returned a call? We've been trying to reach you for hours. Dad's in the hospital, it's bad, as bad as it gets. No time for details, we're losing him fast. Hurry, fill up. Cameron lifted a hand, one that had held the wheel of dozens of boats, planes, cars that raced, one that could show a woman shuddering glimpses of heaven. And that hand shook as he dragged it through his hair. I have to go home. You are home. Martine decided to give him another chance and step forward to rub her body over his. No, I have to go. He nudged her aside and headed for the phone. You have to go. I need to make some calls. You think you can tell me to go? Sorry. Rain check. His mind just wouldn't engage. Absently, he pulled bills out of his pocket with one hand, picked up the phone with the other. Cab fare. He said, forgetting she was booked in the same hotel. Pig! Naked and furious, she launched herself at him. If he had been steady, he'd have dodged the blow, but the slap connected in the quick swipe. His ears rang, his cheeks stung, and his patience snapped. Cameron simply locked his arm around her, revolted when she took that as a sexual overturn, and carted her to the door. He took the time to scoop up her dress, then tossed both the woman and the silk into the hall. Her shriek rattled the teeth in his head as he threw the bowl. I'll kill you, you pig. You bastard. I'll kill you for this. Who do you think you are? You're nothing. Nothing! He left Martin screaming and pounding at the door and went into the bedroom to throw a few necessities into a bag. It looked like luck had just taken the nastiest of turns. <sighs> that's the end of the first chapter. Or, well, it's the prologue. But I hope you enjoyed it. If not, that's cool. If so, let me know. Bye.